people here already and waiting. You guys are, are awesome. Cannot watch. Sorry, Jeb. Deal with wildlife every day. I work in retail. I, I work in retail in pet stores, and man, oh, man, do I uh, respect retail workers. I don't have people come in and tell me, you know, oh, I know a thing or two. People seem to think that everybody in a pet store, maybe it's the internet, it doesn't help. People think that everybody in a pet store actually knows nothing about the animals they're selling. And I have like, people come up all the time and be like, oh, you know, I know a thing or two about snakes. And I'm like, well, I've kept a snake or two myself. <laughs> so, yeah. Back now. Chilling nine minutes left until your siblings get on the bus. Hi, hi friends. All right. Anthony, Basil, Lemine, Stuart. How are you, Stuart? All right, guys. So... Straight off the bat, I thought what we might talk about tonight, and you guys are probably all familiar with this, you watch me every week, but for the people who watch later on, um, I, I had somebody message me on our, on our TikTok page in the last couple of days, and they wanted to know what's a high paying job they can do working with wildlife. And it broke my heart to tell them that you've got two choices. It's either not work with wildlife and get a high paying job, or accept a low paying job and work with wildlife. And it sounds negative, but it, it's sort of true to an extent. Um, but then they said, well, what, what can I do to work with wildlife? And there's a bunch of things that, you know, I wish that people hadn't told me when I started wanting to work with wildlife. Uh, the first thing that everybody says when you want to work with wildlife is, you know, education. What do I have to do? And my parents, like most parents, meant well. And we're in the age where everybody has to go and do a, a university degree. So they said, oh, you're going to have to do zoology. And I started a zoology, zoology degree and then I figured out I'm a terrible uni student. I don't sit still well. You guys watch me all the time. You, you, could you imagine me locked up in a lecture theatre for four years? So um, I dropped out and I found a, basically an apprenticeship as a zookeeper. So when it comes to education, if you're wanting to work with wildlife, the first big sort of uh, top topic thing that people want to know is education. What do I have to study? And do I have to do tertiary studies? And look, it depends where you are, what your goal is, what zoo you want to work at, um, you know, what country you're in, things like this. In the United States, it definitely requires, well, 99% of the time, requires some sort of college education. Here in Australia, there seems to be two main paths. A lot of people go into a university degree in animal sciences or zoology or biology or whatever. And a lot of people, about half the people I know, do what I did. They went up and they started a small little private park in North Queensland, you know, four staff, not Melbourne Zoo, and um, got their foot in the door that way. And they, they started working that way. So I don't want to discourage people. I would have got discouraged because I'm not a good student. And if I had have listened to all the people at first who said, look, if you want to do this job, you need to have a degree, I wouldn't be doing what I do now. So I don't want to say you don't want to have to do any study. But there is some studies that will help. If you can do a tertiary study, be fantastic for you. If you don't want to do a tertiary study, a few other things you should be doing is at least in high school, do biology. You want to have a basic understanding of biology. Some schools now do animal studies, environmental science. Any understanding of, of science is going to help you. Um, besides your, your knowledge of animals though, the next big piece of advice that nobody says that I think makes a fantastic difference as a zookeeper is get some physical skills. And I don't just mean physical skills, cleaning and, and stuff like that. We'll talk about that next. But a lot of private parks, you know, people think of zoos, they think of Australia Zoo or Melbourne Zoo. And, you know, they've got the zookeepers and they've got a maintenance team. But that's a small percentage of zoos. And they're often zoos that are very hard to get into. Most people there have worked at a smaller zoo and then moved across. Now, if you're working at a small zoo, if you have some experience with animals, but you've got some physical skills, if you can, you know, put up a fence, if you can do mock rock, artificial rocking, if you've got some you know, horticulture experience, you can make the enclosures look beautiful. You basically can fill the role of a maintenance person and a zookeeper at the same time. You're gonna get a major foot in the door. Uh, at Werribee Zoo, I've got friends at Werribee Zoo now. Half the staff at Werribee Zoo come from an agricultural background, a farming background like me, because you know it's an open range zoo. They're having to, to look at the grass and the pasture and decide, how, do we have too many animals on here? Do we not have enough animals on here? Um, so, yeah, physical skills is the second thing. We'll catch up on some comments and then move on to some other stuff. My video quality on YouTube is set to minimum. Yeah, I'll, I'll have to work on that. I don't, know, I don't know how to change anything on YouTube. Accidentally ate my Flinders Ranger Scorpion. What should I do? Uh, there wasn't a lady who swallowed a scorpion. Swallow a bird? Don't know. It wriggled and jiggled and giggled inside you. 
Thanks for coming over to TikTok, guys. Yeah, thank you very much for hopping over from TikTok. Get a Jared. Get a Keith. How is everybody? Morning in the UK. Morning in Hull. Most entertaining night of the week. Caitlin the Carrot had to take my pug to the vet to see if he broke his bone. Hey, Nick, you had a, hope you had a great father's day. I did. Unfortunately, I'm the only person in my house who's not sick at the moment. So my father's day was spent making lemon and honey drinks for my daughter and my wife. But um, yeah, I had the day off. So that was kind of nice. Actually, I spent the day trying. I spent most of my father's day wrestling a wombat, trying to put out a wombat video for you guys this week. But um, it didn't work. So <laughs> you wouldn't believe it. I decided it would be easier to handle an eastern brown snake and do a snake bite first aid video. And that's why I've got a snake bite video this week. Um, rather than doing the wombat. He was chasing around his wombat all day. Oh, I, she's terrible. There, is there an island called Snake Island? There's an island off the coast of Brazil that's colloquially known as Snake Island. It's actually got a, a name in Portuguese, but everybody knows it as Snake Island. All right. So, what, g'day, Sammy. How are you? G'day, Davili. All right, guys. So... We've, we've, while we've caught up on comments, I've said two things, if you want to work with wildlife. The, the education thing, degree helps, but there's a bunch of subjects you can do at school that go a long way. The next thing is some physical skills, you know, some building skills, um, you know, horticultural skills. It's going to make you different to other applicants. The third big mistake people do if they want to work with wildlife is they go, I want to be a reptile keeper, or I want to be an elephant keeper or I want to be a tiger keeper. It's fine to have those dreams. It's fantastic to have those dreams. But if you want to be a reptile keeper and your local zoo has the reptiles you want to work with, but they have a job raking the kangaroo pen, take it, take it. Because the keepers that get to work with those cool animals have probably worked in 10 different departments before they got to work with those animals. Because everybody wants to work with tigers. So, you know, they started, you know, looking after the goats at the kids' petting zoo. And after a while, management realizes, look, this guy does everything we ask him. He's a fantastic keeper. Uh, we want to keep him. How do we make sure we keep him? And, the, you know, you work up that way. So, you know, everybody has a dream. I want to work with this or I want to work with that. And, and th that's fine. But work with whatever you can. Not only because it will get your foot in the door, but because you'd be amazed how transferable the skills are. I now, you know, I used to be a zookeeper. Now I run Wicked Wildlife, but I work on a farm. And everybody I meet in the agricultural industry, farming, I've gone the other way. A lot of people go from farming. To, a lot of zookeepers had sort of an agricultural background because it helps. A lot of farmers go, well, how'd you find coming from zoos to farming? So well, basically it's the same thing. The only difference is I've gone from having to know everything about 50 species in my care to having two, sheep and cows. <laughs> um, but the skills, observation skills, making sure everything's got food, everything's got water, what's gaining weight, what's losing weight, um, maintaining enclosures, they're just bigger enclosures. So the skills are really, really transferable. So work with whatever you can. Love Quasimodo. We'll get Quasimodo out in a little bit. This is our baby scrub python and she hasn't even peed on me today. It's fantastic. Nah, I just wanna work with monkeys. It's funny, I've got a few friends who Monkeys is that the only thing that they've ruled out they don't want to work with. And, and not because they don't like monkeys, but because they feel no, no matter what they do with monkeys, and they've worked with monkeys in the past, no matter what they feel they do with monkeys, no matter how hard they work, how stimulating they make the environment, they feel it's not doing them justice because they're so clever that they need so much enrichment. Um, that Yeah, I've got a few very good friends who have got experience with monkeys who say they just, they feel broken hearted the whole time. Whoa, Davili! Start a fun for a camera. Oh, and buy some merch. Thank you very much. I don't have my jumper tonight, but if you do want merch, guys, we have t-shirts, we have jumpers. I've got my Be Nice to Wildlife mug <laughs> with the Wicked Wildlife logo on the back. But yeah, guys, uh, if you are wanting to support us, there's a bunch of ways. You can buy some merch. Um, super chat, so very much appreciate it. But uh, the biggest thing is our patron supporters. Davili, um, Tamara, the... the there's a bunch of people on here who support us on Patreon, and uh, and we try and give you guys some perks as well. Dave Oz, how are you? James, it's sad. Our countries like American buy pets like monkeys. Often they don't realize how difficult it is. I know. I don't want to say I'm against exotic pets, because it's a slippery slope. You know, I don't think monkeys should be kept as pets. But do I 
I think somebody who's got the experience and the facilities should be banned from keeping them. I don't know. If I say that, well, then people turn that around and say, well, people shouldn't keep snakes and people shouldn't keep lizards. What's coming out tonight? We've got a tiger snake. Um, I might get out uh, Rowdy and I might get out Nala. Yeah, I thought I'd let Tamara break the news to you. <laughs> got our mugs today. Fantastic. Sammy and Davili have bought, single-handedly bought just about every mug that I had. If you fix the quality of YouTube videos, you'll have a lot more views. You'll look it up for me. Thank you. I don't know if I'll be able to do it while I'm doing a live stream. <laughs> I'm not very good with technology. We get snakes at work. What can we do to prevent snakes, if anything? Um, preventing snakes. I'll put this guy back. He's been out for a little while. Preventing snakes is a tricky thing. So there's nothing that will actively deter snakes. So there's the, um, you know, the, maybe I'll get out. Jake. Do you want to say hello to everybody, Jake? Yeah, we've been out since last Tuesday, right? All right. So as far as deterring snakes, there's all sorts of myths and things that people say get into their snakes. There's these little electric buzzing units. Uh, they don't work. I, I know a lot of snake catchers have caught snakes wrapped around them. Um, I know in other countries people sell potions and stuff from Bunnings that you can, like, pour on the lawn and it's meant to keep them away. Doesn't work. Um, what you can do is remove the things that attract snakes. And snakes are attracted by food, water, and shelter. So food, um, chicken coops is a big one. You know, people have chicken coops. The snakes aren't coming to eat the chickens. The chickens are really too big. Unless you're, you're living in towns and you've got carpet pythons or something. Um, but chickens attract rats, and rats attract snakes. So um, if you've got birds, if you've got chickens, if you've got rabbits, whatever, um, keep the food locked up. You know, we, we keep a lot of chickens here. And look, we're a farm. I love snakes, but I have a three-year-old girl who also likes snakes. So we don't want venomous snakes in the backyard. So what we do is when I feed my wombat or my birds or my possums, we only feed them what they need for one day. There's never leftover food. And all food that's not being used is in, you know, mouse-proof enclosures. We don't want to attract rats and mice. So that's a good one. Um, you know... Food, if you, if you really, really don't want snakes, you know, a pretty pond with frogs is a fantastic thing to have. Not if you're terrified of attracting snakes. So keep, you know, your lawns trimmed, um, no food around, stuff like that. Um, shelter, like I said, short lawns. Don't grow your grass three foot high and then wonder why you've got snakes on the, at, at work. Uh, things like corrugated iron and tin, people have lying around their properties. If you're gonna have, you know, that stuff, construction stuff, keep it stacked up in a vertical way. Now, if, you, if I have sheets of tin lying down like this, snakes are going to live in between the sheets of tin. If I have it standing up, they don't have that to hide between. Pipes, keep them standing up. Things like this. Uh, there is snake mesh, you know, like tiny mouse-proof mesh that some people swear by. And it might stop 80%, but they can't. snakes can't climb over it. So, um, you know, it's tricky. Good morning, Carolyn, how are you? You're the 14th like, but there are 48 people here. I think a lot of people here are new. Carolyn, so they probably don't even know to leave a thumbs up. Make sure you leave a thumbs up, guys. Heard a story about a family that lived in the in the lighthouse on the island. Venomous snakes got in the lighthouse and the family members got bitten and died. Uh, I haven't heard the story, but it's not impossible, especially if it was like a long time ago and on an island without medical care. But the snakes wouldn't have came into the house to look for people. Like, I, I don't want to say it's impossible that this family got bitten by snakes and died. But it is impossible that the snake said, I'm going to get into that house to bite these people. Snakes don't think that way. They don't have that mental thought process. Your video quality is perfect now. I don't know what I've changed. Watching on two screens. Oh, so I've really only got 48 viewers out there, Abby. Is that what you're saying? Brian, you're late, but we'll forgive you. because it's dynamic. Nick, that island is full of snakes. Yeah, yeah. So, so there's an island in off South Australia. I can't remember the name of it. I should do. It's got tiger snakes here. It's absolutely swimming with snakes. There's a lot of snakes. Um, but th no matter how many snakes there is on an island or anywhere, they're not going to come after you. Um, they, they just live there, and the chances of coming across one is higher. Reevesby, that's the one. Reevesby Island. 
uh, has a really high density of tiger snakes. I always get Reesby and Rottnest confused. Um, but yeah, so Reesby Island has a really high density of tiger snakes. And I remember seeing a photo, I don't know if it was a lighthouse, where they put corrugated iron fences around their houses. They dug the corrugated iron this far in the ground and it was only you know this high above the ground to stop the tiger snakes getting into the houses. Um, and yeah, we're talking about the early 1800s. No anti-venom. You had to, you know, get on a rowboat to get back to the mainland if you needed help, so. Oh, dynamic, yes, yeah, so when the internet is struggling, drop to a lower resolution. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> All that stuff's way above my pay grade. Shorty internet here. Thank you very much, Maxfield. Oh, James, thank you. If you are gonna leave super checks, guys, you know, it, it, it's a massive help. But if you do want to leave a question or ask to see something, and I feel at least that way I can give you something. What breed is Quasimodo? Uh, I can get Quasimodo out for you. Uh, Quasimodo is a coastal carp python. So, and Jake, the one I just had out, I might bring you back out again a little bit, Jake, is a, a Murray Darling carp python or an inland carp python. Uh, Quasi, who has only been fed the other day, so as long as he doesn't think he's getting bed with my hand cut down. Hey, buddy. He had a big feed too, because one of my other snakes didn't need a quail. Oh, and you can't even see. So yeah, this is Quasi. And Quasi is a coastal carpet python. So, you know, the carpet python family, well, it's really the carpet python species. And I know I say this every week for all the regulars, but uh, carpet pythons are, are all basically one species, or two species if you really want to argue. Um, there's just lots of different colors. So we've got Samson, who's a, a Darwin carpet. We've got Diana. She's a diamond carpet python. Uh, this follows a Centralian carpet python. It's a coastal carpet python. One I just had out to Murray Darling carpet python. Genetically, it's like saying somebody from, from Japan, Kenya, and Australia are all different species. We're all the same species with just different color variations and size variations for our environments. But uh, Quasi is the coastal carpet python, which is probably, arguably the most well-known, maybe along with the diamond. Um, just because it's found on the east coast of Australia, it's where the biggest part of the Australian population is. Um, but also the coastal carpet is the biggest of the, the coastal carpet python sort of subspecies or variations. Um, you know, coastals regularly can get up, yeah, up over the three metre mark. Um, I've heard stories of four metre coastals, but I'd like to see one. Um, Whereas the others, yeah, th these guys grow to be, be the longest of the carpet pythons. They're also probably one of the most variable in terms of colour. Learn parenti exhibits in captivity do have rock, sand and logs. Yeah, we were talking about that the other day. So, so you know, rock, sand, logs and stuff, they're, they make it look nice. But in my opinion, they're also very important for monitors because they, they create basking places and they create thermal mass. For some reason, I'm in the weirdest of places, I get the perfect internet, huh? I get terrible in it. Don't know how to send super chats. I'm not sure how to show up from my end. When you, when you, you've got the little option to type stuff in. There's like a, a I think a money icon. Don't worry though, mate. We, we <laughs> I'll read out what you say anyway. Take the time to greet me. Every, you're you're famous here, Carolyn. You wouldn't believe it. When you're not here, we have a bunch of people say, "Where's Carolyn? We haven't heard from Carolyn for a while." And tomorrow kindly reminds everybody that it's like 3 a.m. or 4 a.m. over there. Um, and we're just lucky that you managed to catch it when we do. You have good advice to this Kiwi on TikTok. So this is, oh, well, thank you very much. I used to I used to work in sort of remote mine sites in, in Queensland. And most of the people that I worked with, actually everybody I've met who welds poly pipe, plastic pipe together, they were all Kiwis. Um, and they kept me in work because these guys wouldn't get, we dug a big trench, like 10 kilometers at a time um, to put these pipes in the ground. And the Kiwis wouldn't get in the trench every day until somebody pulled all the snakes out. So that was my job. So, um, and uh, one of my best friends out there met this big Maori fella called Blue. I didn't even know his real name. He's just Blue. Um, tattoos all over his head and he, he's a tough looking dude. And we were driving the car one day and um, there's a little bearded dragon in the middle of the road. And it's my job to, to move him, but I was in the driver's seat. So I said, oh, Blue, can you just get out and shoo him off the road? And Blue walks up, this bearded dragon goes, Oi, get off the road, you. <laughs> and this bearded dragon looks up at him and keeps sitting on the road. 
A nice shout out the window. Blue, just pick it up. And this man lost it. I was terrified of this bloke. He was so big. And he, the, the thought of picking up this bloke, you want me to pick it up? <laughs> In the end, I had to get out. And I picked up this bearded dragon. And there's 20 cars piling up on the track, you know, trying to get past us. But Blue's got this photo touching the, the tip of the tail of the bearded dragon with a thumbs up to send back to his daughter in New Zealand. It's like, look how brave dad is. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I've got fond memories of Kiwis. I loved working with Kiwis. Hey, Nick, how are you? I'm great, mate. How are you? Connor Bludges Aussie Music. I follow you on TikTok, I reckon. Prayfully become a patron from Week of Wildlife. I hope others... Yeah, Carol, I've, I've, I don't know if you use Facebook. I've sent you a link to... Because we've got a private Facebook group for our, our Patreon supporters. And I've sent you a link to it. But I didn't want to hassle you if, in case you didn't use Facebook. But you do have a link there. If you're, you're more than welcome to join, um, you know, it means that people can get on to me whenever they want. And they can talk to each other. Love the little Week of Wildlife. I know. It's, it's actually been good... I, I tried doing live streams like two years ago and it just didn't really work. I didn't have, and maybe I didn't have enough followers, I don't know. Um, but since we've started doing it again, it's become great fun and, and it's really helped the, sort of the, the Patreon page where everybody knows each other. They talk all, <laughs> they all know each other on the Patreon Facebook group and then they see each other all, hear each other when they're in there. Too true, who wear blue, that shirt, that shirt. I know, I didn't even get to wash this shirt today, I was working in it. Yeah, that's us Kiwis. We don't have most of these reptiles. We don't like the unknown. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, they're, they're a fun breed, Kiwis. I've, I've, my partner desperately wants to get over there because we live in South West Victoria. It's dairy country. And there's a lot of Kiwis here in the, the dairy and the sheep, uh, basically shearing and, and dairy workers. And her friends are all here and they're Kiwis. They've all moved home. And she desperately wants to get over there and visit. I keep saying, well, if we're going to visit, I'm going to have to find some videos I can do over there. Started as a volunteer at Kyabra and Fauna Park. Say hello to Lockie for me. I think Ben's not there anymore. Ben Stubbs was their old reptile keeper. I know him. But yeah, Lachlan is uh, in charge at Kyabra. I know Lachlan well. How old is Quasimodo? I, I don't actually know. Um, in fact, almost all my pythons all my pythons that I can think of, except for the little scrubby, I don't know their ages. And the problem with, with snakes is... Their growth rate is based on how warm they are, how much they're fed, um, not on their age. So, you know, I could have a one-year-old or two-year-old snake this size. I could have a 15-year-old snake this size. Uh, it depends how well it's been looked after. And the other issue with snakes is they often have several homes in their lifetime. And all four of these snakes were snakes that other people had lost interest in that needed homes. Um, so the information on when they were born was just lost. It was, you know, I've had him three years and he was an adult when he came to me. So because of COVID, live streams have come up in the world, which has been good for creators. Not sure what you could film, but I'm sure you could find something. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure we could find something. I'd love to film, well, two Ataris. If I could find a zoo that's got two Ataris, I'd love to do a video with it. Um, what's your, your khaki pose? You've got the um, oh, the cutty, but the cutty bows your spider. You've got the giant flightless parrots over there, cacapos. All the New Zealand has some cool animals, and I like the idea of New Zealand's wildlife. You don't have any snakes, which is a real yeah <laughs> bugger for me. But um, I like countries whose animals are overlooked. It's like Australian wildlife. You know, everybody thinks about kangaroos and koalas, which are fantastic. But um, I like you know, I'd love to do like Papua New Guinea, for instance. Laugh that person actually had me laughing. Stole the cockatoo from Kyber and Fauna Park. Jumped in my partner's purse. Yeah, Kyber have some cool animals. Do have sand, small rocks, dried plants from the outback, similar to South Australian Queensland. Yeah, so inland type and exhibits are often use sand just to rep make it look deserty. Inland type bands are usually found in what we call gibber plains, basically small stone, like stony deserts is typical inland type and habitat, but people look at it and they want to see sand as the desert. So it, building enclosures is a tricky thing. In, in, enclosures for zoos, you need it to be secure for the animal. You need it to be aesthetically pleasing for the public. You need it to be built in a way where the snake or the animal feels like it's hiding, but the public can still see it. But there's a lot of things to, to take in, bear in mind. Kim and Ada, how are you guys? I saw your doc, your, your, um, your 
school project on the dingo Ada. You did very well. Thank you to the moderators, Tamara, Carolyn, who've been cool. There's a particular cat channel, we can't even make jokes. Yeah, we're pretty lighthearted here, but I'm very glad that we've got some moderators. Um, Tamara has um, certainly had, Tamara's put her big boots on since she got the Tamara, the, uh, the moderator badge, and she, she keeps things rolling for us. All our moderators do, but Tamara is here like every single week and reminds me when it's time to move from one platform to another. So, um, yeah. Haven't got, done enough to get the wrench yet. I could probably give you a wrench, mate. Uh, has there been an infestation of cane toads before? Yeah, we do have a pretty severe infestation of cane toads in Australia. Um, 100 years ago now, maybe 102 or something like that, they were introduced to North Queensland. Uh, they brought over 101 toads, uh, two died. So 99 toads were released in uh, on the coast of Queensland and they've now crossed the West Australian border. Um, how can you join Patreon? If you want to support us on Patreon, it's just uh, patreon.com forward slash wicked wildlife. Um, or I put a link to it in the comment section of all our videos. Um, you follow the, the links there. It's pretty simple. There's, you know, different tiers that people can support us at. Uh, and then I can send you some details for a Facebook group and stuff. Reptile enthusiast myself, 46 and counting. Lucky to find you on TikTok. I'm glad you found me on TikTok, Samantha. You just gotta be annoying like me, Davili. Oh, Tamara's not afraid to ask, I'll put it that way. <laughs> but, but she earns it. After I complete my venomous snake course, do you reckon it's worth doing some experience with the snake catcher? Yeah, for sure. So if you're, if you're working at Kyabrum already, um, you can talk to you know the, the team at Kyabrum once you've got, basically doing the course doesn't, make you a snake handler or a snake catcher, but it gives you the basics, but it also shows prospective people like the managers at Kybra that you're willing to take it seriously. Um, do lots and lots of handling with non-venomous snakes. H handling snakes, handling any animals, whether you're handling venomous snakes or horses or you know rough cattle, if you're on, on a farm, 99% um, of snake handling is observation and reading body language. Um, people talk about reaction. If you're relying on reaction time, it's only a matter of time before you're get, gonna get bitten. Your reactions will never be as fast as the snakes. So um, you'll learn just as much from handling non-venomous snakes as you will from venomous snakes, and you can work your way up. Uh, but the course will go a long way. Never give a wrench to anybody who asks for a wrench. <sighs> Sorry to Billy. <laughs> Nick, are the animals all right? Yeah, our animals are all pretty good uh, at the moment. There's not too many dramas going on. Most of the time there's a drama somewhere, but no, everything's all right at the moment. When I get to Australia, I would like to be something, get over my favorite snakes. There's plenty of places, it, when you come to Australia, um, you know, places like Hillsville Sanctuary, Melbourne Zoo, Ballarat Wildlife Park, we, like we don't have people come to us because we don't have the insurance for it, but we take our animals out to people. So like we, this year it's not gonna run, but we do Ballarat show, Swan Hill show, Eden Oak show, Nil show, all sorts of agricultural shows. And a lot of people were scared of snakes come up and handle our animals there. Been practicing the snake hook on some pythons. Yeah, pythons. Um, if you can get access to colubrids, brown tree snakes, green tree snakes, they're a little bit whippy and they'll teach you a little bit. Should let me come do the course I want to do snake catching. Yeah, funnily enough, I've never done a snake catching course. Um, I, thought I should probably go and do one just so I can get the paperwork. But... I've never been able to do one because I've always been employed in the sector where I've been working for a company and the course is ran by like their competitor and my boss is like, well, just don't do the course. I'd rather you not go work for somebody else for the week. Um, so I've, I've never done the snake handling course. I've just always learned on the job. We have a lot of Eastern Browns and Tigers, regional New South Wales. I live in, in Western Victoria and we don't get, well, we really don't get any brown snakes where I am. I can go half an hour north and we'd get a few, uh, but we're tiger snake country down here. Ada wants to know, is Quasi a carpet python? Quasi is a carpet python. So we've got a lot of carpet pythons. We've got uh, Quasimodo is a carpet python, is a coastal carpet python. Samson here 
is a Darwin carpet python. So Samson is a Darwin carpet. Diana is a diamond carpet. And this fellow up here is a Murray Darling carpet. So lots of different carpet pythons. They're just different colours for different parts of the country. So, you know, the Centralian carpet, for instance, it's red and brown, blends in the desert. Um, whereas, you know, the coastal carpet, it's more sort of a, a tanny green colour, blends in his environment. Then you've got snakes like the diamond pipe, and they're black and yellow, which sounds terrible for camouflage. But black and yellow works two ways. It fits in with the dappled sunlight, the bottom of the forest floor. But also the black, she lives in, in Far East Gippsland, coldest part of, coldest place in the world that any python lives. So being black helps her warm up as well. So different colours enable... Pythons live in different, different parts of the country. Do I have a red belly black? We do have a red belly black. I'm gonna get a red belly black snake out, actually. Are there any dangerous pythons to humans? Um, reticulated pythons are the only snake on the planet to have been confirmed to eat somebody in the wild. Like, people have been eaten by reticulated pythons in the wild. Um, there has been a death from a scrub python in captivity in Australia. Like a person had it as a pet, it, it constricted them. Um, Burmese pythons, they're capable of killing somebody. Um, they're not big enough to eat you. It's you, it's a feeding mistake. Retics can eat you if you're four foot tall and live in Borneo. Um, you know, the Australian rugby team are not gonna get eaten by reticulated pythons, <laughs> but in the countries where retics are found, people are smaller, and as a result, they get eaten from time to time. One or two people a year, apparently. So yeah, there, there is some pythons that are dangerous to people. Um, but yeah, like I said, Burmese, uh, things like this, they can't eat, oh, nobody's ever been eaten by a berm, but they're very common in captivity, and um, yeah, people make feeding mistakes, they, they're defrosting a rabbit, they go in the enclosure, snake bites a hand instead of the rabbit, wraps it up, they don't have any assistance, um, yeah, they've got more muscle, spot on, that's it, what, they're just too strong. Does the Atherton Tablelands have pythons? Yeah, you get, I don't know if you get jungle carpets or coastal carpets even you get carpet pythons and up that direction you'd get scrub pythons but i couldn't tell you if they're on the tablelands themselves you'd also get spotted pythons like i'll get out a red belly first and then we'll get out a spotted python ada wants a diamond python what have i said diamond pythons are great snakes what now eats someone i've never heard of a snake eating somebody yeah <laughs> snakes eating people is an incredibly rare thing but it has happened um, and you know, we're talking about the world's biggest snakes in a country where people are not very big. All right, so we wanted to have a look at the red belly black snake. At the moment, he's more of a white belly black snake because he's due to shed his skin any day now. He should have the day off, but he's just such a cruisy slug that, you know, <laughs> we'll take him out anyway. Um, so yeah, this is Brutus, he's our red belly black snake. Is uh, one of the most famous snakes in the well, certainly in Australia, and probably the most famous snake on our channel. All the TikTok people love the red belly black snake, and all the live stream guys, you you all, all know Brutus as well now. Is um, in a weird way, he's one of the best snakes I have to handle. He's probably better than half the pythons I have to handle, but you hope I reckon you're gonna shed in the next day or two. He's started to clear up. So, the reason snakes go clouding that eye's clear. The reason snakes go cloudy, if I can show you this eye, he can't see very well. And the reason snakes go cloudy is between their old new skin. Oh, thank you very much for the super chat. I'll get back to it in a second. Between the old skin and the new skin, there's basically a fluid that builds up that helps the, the skin peel off. And um, because they don't have eyelids, they can't close their eyes. There's a scale that covers their eyes, and that fluid means it, it's like they're looking through a glass of dirty water. Uh, but just before they shed, often they clear up as the skin sort of starts to separate. So he's starting to actually clear up. You can see in one eye, he's cleared up already. So I reckon he'll shed any day now. So, all right, I'm going to pop him down. I'm going to read this thing. And then we're going to get out Spitfire because Spitfire has not been out for weeks. Speaking of shedding snakes, Spitfire is one snake that he is terrible to handle when he's shedding. And I don't blame him. Like, when he's shedding his skin, he's vulnerable. He can't see what's happening. It could be me. It could be, you know, the devil. It could be anybody handling him. Um, so Spitfire gets very hard to handle. Brian, thank you very much, mate. You're a legend. Um, please send me a pic when he sheds. He's shed already tomorrow. I, I, 
I can show you the. He doesn't shed in a nice big piece, but um, I'll get him out now, and you can see him. He doesn't shed and look all pretty though. He's quite dull still. Blows my mind now. You can handle casually handle that red brother black snake. How venomous is the red brother black snake? I don't have the number for it. It's I don't know, somewhere in the top thirty. Um, venomous enough to ruin your day, but they've never been recorded killing somebody, um, or at least you know since in modern medical history. Been annoying you daily about him. I, Tamara, to, I got him up this morning and checked Spitfire and he hadn't shed his skin. And it's been like 10 days and he's looked ugly as. I sent you a, a photo the other day. I'm like, oh, Tamara's going to be disappointed. And he shed this afternoon in like 100 pieces. Um, but yeah, I'll move the camera back because we'll, we'll put Spitfire on the ground to work him. Um, is this YouTube all about snakes or is there different animals, different weeks? Uh, we cover lots of different animals. Um, we have wombats. I've got a crocodile. I can get a crocodile out. Um, but our live streams are often snake-based because it's dark outside. It's like 9 o'clock. Um, and my possums, my wombats, stuff like that are just hard to handle for videos. Um, but our, our Sunday videos, if, if you've just jumped on and you've searched back through, we've got videos on koalas and possums and wombats and crocodiles and... All sorts of stuff, echidnas, um, yeah, basically Australian wildlife. But for the live streams, I don't know, everybody wants to see snakes. What would happen if I pulled the shedding off too early? Um, some people reckon you can like damage the scales if you pull it off too early. Um, it's hard not to, it's kind of like popping pimples. People just can't help it and they want to, want to pull it off. You want to have a shed of snake skin on my gaming setup. I got shed. I had Isabella in here today. And I don't know what she's done with all my skins. Like I have them lying everywhere. I've got this one here. On top of this cover, there's a blue tongue one. Like I have buckets of this stuff. <laughs> Normally I give it to the local kindergarten and they use it for arts and crafts. Because what am I going to do with it? All right, guys. I'm going to lower this down because Spitfire is a big old boy. And um, he just seems more comfortable working on the ground. So... I'll get back on your questions. I want to see a peacock spider. I want to see a peacock spider too. Might need a macro lens. This is just on my iPhone. So I don't, I, 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 I do have a camera and then I never figured out how to use it. So, all right, Spitfire. He's not that ugly today actually, tomorrow. He's, he's come up all right. But talk about his skin, here you go. Some of my snakes shed nice big pieces. This is Spitfire's skin. It's disgusting. Look at that bin. All right. So this is Spitfire. You've actually got a little bit of rubbing on your nose, Spitfire. Spitfire is one snake I have that is notorious for nose rubbing. And because he's been shedding his skin, he was actually struggling to shed a little bit. So I put a second rock in there, which is just a little bit more abrasive. And, um... He must have rubbed his nose on it. All right. We'll see if he wants to sit up for us. But ah, uh, you're peeing already on me. All right, we'll, we'll sit you on the ground. So Spitfire here is one of the couple of tiger snakes that we keep here at Wicked Wildlife. He's probably the big, well, he's definitely the biggest. Probably one of the biggest tiger snakes I've ever really seen or, or worked with in captivity. And this boy here is one of the only snakes I have that was born in the wild. I don't know the exact story or the year, um, but through the paperwork and through the people that sent him to me, we figured out that this guy here was collected from South Australia in Mount Gambier, which is only oh, an hour and a half from me, uh, for anti-venom production. He lived in CSL laboratories, uh, or sorry, venom supplies in South Australia for several years before he went up to live with people in New South Wales. As an educational animal doing venomous snake shows. You can't see him, sorry guys. <laughs> um, so, yeah, he, he was caught out of the wild on a permit. Normally we can't catch snakes out of the bush. He was caught out of the wild on a permit. He was used to milk to make anti-venom for several years for pharmaceutical research before he uh, went, became an educational animal and then he came to live with me. So, for a wild snake, he's pretty good, but he, um, he just, yeah, he's not as comfortable sitting on a hook as... If you've seen Rami, our other tiger snake, who's still naughty, he climbs the hook towards my hand every time I take him out. But he still sits pretty good. 
Whereas Spitfire, he's not a mean snake, but he just doesn't ever seem comfortable sitting on a hook. And I don't blame him. Like, he is twice the weight of Rami, if not more. He's a... That's a big tiger snake. So there's all that weight on a hook. Thanks. All that weight on a hook can't be comfortable. But this species, the eastern tiger snake, it's about the fourth or fifth most venomous snake in the world. And uh, up until the 1900s, this snake was the leading cause of snake bite death in the country. Um, you know, early, when early Europeans arrived, hey Lucy, when early Europeans arrived, uh, if they were killed by a snake, it was most likely this species. Simply because where they lived on the east coast, this is the species coming into contact with the most people. As more people moved inland, particularly after the First World War, returning soldiers were given blocks of land inland. Um, towns like Dubbo and Burke and Kanamala all started growing um, off the wool industry and whatnot, returning soldiers. And uh, we suddenly had people getting bitten by brown snakes. But before then, the tiger snake was a leading cause of snake bite death. And that makes sense when you realise that the tiger snake antivenom was the first antivenom we ever had in Australia. And it was around for 50 years before they brought out the next antivenom, which is the brown snake antivenom. So, which is now the most, um, you know, the leading cause of snake bite death. But there you go tomorrow. I hope you got to see, I'll see if I can get him a little bit close to you for a, a look. You'll have to excuse his rub nose, that'll heal up in a few days. But he is a, he is a pretty boy. He's a chunky tiger snake too, like. Who doesn't like Spitfire? Hey boy. Good boy. Had a good snake. Spitfire hasn't been out in a couple of weeks, so I hope you enjoyed that. Ooh. Oh, Alex, thank you very much. If I was allowed to keep an exotic lapid, what would I keep? Um, I work with like uh, Indian cobras. I wouldn't mind keeping Indian cobras. Um, based purely of looks, I'd love to keep Siamese spitters. I, I, I looked, I kept Siamese spitters at a zoo. Uh, black and white spitters, Americans call them. Um, the only reason I probably wouldn't keep spitters myself is that because they spit, there's an issue with spitters causing allergic react like hypersensitivity in in keepers so people who work with a lot of spitters they're often exposed to venom a lot just through you know them spitting in the environment and uh, a lot of snake keepers reckon that they develop hypersensitivity so they're, they're working with spitting cobras all the time and then they get bitten one day and they go into anaphylactic shock so that'd be my um worry the bread with alpacas yeah got to worry about those alpaca alpaca snakes Quasimodo is the most beautiful and cuddly. He was climbing on my head. A lot of my partners are a bit like that. I'll, maybe I'll get out in Tasha again before we wrap things up. Do death adders use camouflage when sneaking out for food or to hide from predators? Kind of both. So death adders are very cryptic snakes. They spend the vast majority of their time hiding. What's an elapid? Elapids are a fixed fanged venomous snake. So when we think of venomous snakes, I'll get out, I'll get out Nala while we're talking about venomous snakes because she's the large venomous snake we can get out for the night. When we're talking about venomous snakes, there's sort of a, well, three main categories if you're going to take out the sea snakes and sea crabs. So, in Australia, our venomous snakes are pretty much all the elapids. So this girl here is Nala, she's the king brown of the mulga, and her fangs do not move. They're fixed. Uh, in her case, they're, they're very fixed. King browns are, are sort of short, stubby, sharp fangs to punch through a reptile scale. And uh, so this family, the elapids, includes all Australia's venomous snakes, or all Australia's real venomous snakes. Um, it includes things like mambas, coral snakes in the southern United States. Um, and they're usually fairly similar shaped, you know, like the death adder is an unusual shaped one, but whether it's a king brown or whether it's a tiny coral shape, coral snake, the shape is fairly similar. Um, then you've got colubrids. So we do have colubrids in Australia. Tree snakes are colubrids. Uh, our only venomous colubrid is the brown tree snake, although I've heard people say that there's a simple venom in green tree snakes. Um, but they're what colubrids are what we call rear fanged snakes. So the venomous colubrids, rather than having a hollow fang, like all our lapids, they've got um, like a grooved fang, basically, and they have to chew their venom into you. They're really designed to bite things like frogs. Um, so they bite, the venom's right at the back of the mouth, so they have to chew their venom to get into you. So things like brown tree snakes, uh, the Boom slang, I say boom slang, but if Dingo watches this and I say boom slang, he'll make fun of me. 
Um, the boomslang in, in Africa uh, is a colubrid, so the fangs are at the back of his mouth. Um, and then you've got the vipers, which are a huge group of venomous snakes around the world. So all the rattlesnakes are vipers, uh, Russell's vipers, puff adders, the, the, the true adders in Europe, they're all vipers. Um, Australia doesn't have any vipers, they're not found here. All our serious venomous snakes are in lapids, like uh, Nala, the king brown snake here. So this is, of course, Nala. She's our king brown, or mulga. And this species of snake is uh, arguably our biggest venomous snake. So, taipan, coastal taipans are reputed to get a little bit longer, but, you know, we're talking about world record breaking taipans. Um, whereas, king browns are a much bulkier snake. And king browns have the biggest distribution of any snake in the country. So, they're found in every state except for Victoria and Tasmania. And when I say every state, I mean from like the West Australian coast, the entirety of West Australia, except for the very, very bottom corner. Uh, all of Queensland and New South Wales except for the tiny thin band along the coast and um, pretty much the entirety of the Northern Territory. Unfortunately, cane toads have caused a lot of local extinctions, but they're a very cool snake. I love king brown snakes. Actually, the whole black snake family are nice snakes to work with, in my experience, but she's a good girl. We'll put her away, we'll answer some questions, and maybe I'll get out another cuddly snake. Um, or we'll get out some lizards, eh? All right, do you want to see another python or do you want to see some lizards? Night, Alex. Thank you for coming by. I do have a copperhead. I won't get him out tonight. He just stresses. He doesn't like being handled. When I handle him, he broom slung. I can't say it. <laughs> I'm an Australian. Rami Nick needs these snake sticks. I don't have a measuring tape in here. I do have two snake sticks. I've got my, the only snake hook I've ever paid paid for one of these little jobs but you can see it like bending when I, <laughs> I hold anything beyond the death adder so um what i really need to invest in is a pinning stick the inland type your favorite snake inland type ends are very cool snakes if i had a chance would i own a gaboon viper i don't know i'd, I'd love to film with gaboon vipers whether I'd want to dedicate room in my enclosure, like in, you know, an enclosure in my room, to gaboons, I'm not quite sure. Um, I guess being Australian, I'm probably biased. I like big snakes. I'm going to start annoying weekly instead of Rami. Annoying me about what? Python, lizards, python, lizards. All right, we'll get out some lizards. Um... I'll get out Prickle. Prickle is probably my favorite lizard in the world. So this is Prickle. And Prickle is my Cunningham skink. So I used to keep a bunch of Cunningham skinks. I kept them outdoors. They were cool to look at, but you'd never touch them. You'd open the door and they're off like a rocket. Whereas Prickle here, she is so cool. Um, Cunningham skinks are usually skittish animals, but she visits schools and birthday parties and kindergarten. And um, she's a cool, cool species. So this species is found from South Australia, uh, all through, you know, southern third of Victoria and up the coast of New South Wales, I think even into Queensland. Uh, and they're what we call saxicolous, which means they're dependent on rocks for a living. So they're found in or around rocks. There we go. Found in or around rocks. So they're saxicolous. And to live amongst these rocks, they've got a really cool adaptation. So you can't feel. If you had feel of vision, she's got all these real sharp scales, but they all point backwards. So this way she's smooth, and this way it's more obvious on her tail. The other way, she's very, very sharp. And it means if she sees you know, anything moving, she's going to run as fast as she can, uh, head first in between some cracks. Because all those bikes point backwards, you can't pull her out. She sticks in like Velcro. So, really cool animals. Unfortunately, uh, in some places, in South Australia, they're listed as a threatened species because of rock removal. People you know, going out in the bush, collecting rocks to take home, putting their gardens, um, and people stacking rocks and things like this. You're in Perth, Dave. Our, our channel sponsor, I should have said at the beginning, guys, one of our major channel sponsors is actually Perth Reptile Relocations. Michael Duggan is a good friend of mine. He's a snake catcher in Perth. And he's got lots of cool videos on his Facebook page. Uh, and he's one of our biggest supporters. So do check out.
Perth Reptile relocations. Nick is so mellow when he handles those big scary snakes. The only way I know your voice is has the snake sting. <laughs> oh, the only way you know it's venomous. If you want a pinning stick, I'll send that one and two hooks. You got the first two hooks done. Oh, thank you, Rami. Bobtail lizards I keep finding show their tongue in a hostile manner. Yeah, they're just trying to look big and scary and let you go. What breed is your general garden skink? There's like 300 skink species in Australia. Uh, the skink that's found in most gardens in the southern part of Australia is just called the garden skink. Um, but you've got lots of other skinks in other parts of the country that you know I'd, I'd have to crack open a textbook to figure out exactly what you're seeing. Do I have a blue tongue lizard? I've got a lot of blue tongue lizards. Have to write that down in Google. Yeah, Perth Reptile Locations. If you do check out Perth Reptile Relocations, uh, tell them that Wicked Wildlife sent you. The least we can do for their support is, you know, make sure we get some people following their page. So Prickle lives with the only blue tongue that I've got in here at the moment. This is Bertha. And she's my blotched blue tongue, my alpine blotched blue tongue. Um, and she'll go outside in a little while. But she's the only one that came inside to live indoors over winter. Uh, I keep the rest from outdoors, but I needed one inside to use for any shows that we got. Um, so Bertha here is a big old alpine blotch bluey. And of course, if they have merch, buy it. Yeah, my merch, Rept uh, Perth Reptile Recollections, I don't think they have any, but they, they do have a Facebook page and they put up videos of their snake catchers and they catch snakes that I, I can't. So he catches a fair few dugites, he catches Western Australian tiger snakes, which are kind of cool, um, some Western browns. Why do orphan kangaroos get fed special milk formulas? Um, you feed them cow's milk, you're gonna kill them. Um, I, years ago, had a wombat who, who ended up passing away and she came to me with a huge amount of gut issues because the people that rescued her, they kept her for two weeks and fed her on um, formula that they'd feed for a lamb and it completely destroyed her, her gut lining. So we, we thought we'd had her recovered it um, but basically she was stunted her whole life. She, she didn't grow um, because yeah, they've, they've just got different stomach contents. The way their stomach works is different to placental mammals. So they need uh, a special formula. Lizard, lizard, lizard. <laughs> North of Brizzy. Do I keep any dwarf monitors? No, the only monitor I keep these days is Lucy, the lace monitor, who's sound asleep. I'm not gonna wake her up. She's sound asleep over there. Oh, the nightcap. Thank you very much, guys. Guys, if, if you watch us, the nightcap, they're um got a cool like streaming, it's like a chat show. Um, and we might be popping onto their show, you know, once a month or something is like their. I hate the word expert. I hate it. But yeah, we, we might be, you know, once a month popping on, showing a different animal on their show, and they support the channel. So uh, please support the Nightcap guys. They, they, you know, some of our biggest supporters. The lizards you're showing are gigantic compared to us. Yeah, she's a big girl. Um, she'd be the biggest bluey that I have, for sure. Is it true that blue tongue lizards are really common? They're like alligators and bluebell is common here. Yeah, so um, blue tongues are pretty common. Um, different parts of the country, they're gonna be more or less common, but I saw two wild blue tongue lizards today while I was driving around a tractor. Um, if I haven't seen any for a couple of months prior to that, because it's been winter, but if I get a 22, 23 degree day, I've got a few roads here that I could drive and find four or five blue tongue lizards. So they're pretty, pretty common. Do blue tongue lizards have lockjaw? So lockjaw doesn't exist in the, people think of lockjaw like bull terriers. Uh, it's a myth. Um, they don't lock their jaws in place. Um, they do have very strong jaws. Um, so, but lockjaw to me is like a, an eagle's talons. A friend of mine was grabbed on the arm by an eagle working with it in the zoo. And their resting position is actually closed. So once they grip, they don't actually have to maintain that grip with strength. It locks in a position. Whereas a blue tongue, if she bites on you, it's gonna hold on, but she's still exerting herself to hold on. It's not locked in position and then she's not putting in effort, if that makes sense.
Red Bell Black Snake, although it's venom can cause significant illness, no deaths have been recorded from its bite. Yeah, so um, officially there's been no deaths recorded from Red Bellies. I usually say there's been no deaths recorded from Red Bellies. But um, I know some very good snake catchers who reckon there might be one or two deaths that are, you know, like pre records from them. So that, yeah, like they've got some information about. Alright, this will be the last animal for the night, guys. Ooh. Only in 2008 that wombats have cuboid poo. I say square poo, and everybody in the comments says squares are two-dimensional. But yeah, they've got square poo so that it doesn't roll downhill. Remember seeing your pet wombat? I I spent most of my day on Sunday, well, a good couple of hours, three hours on Sunday, trying to film a video with our wombat for you guys. Um, one of our fantastic Patreon supporters, Eccleston Angel, she desperately wants to see, and Dana, Desperately wants to see some wombat videos. And the reason we feature snakes so heavily is I can smash out a snake video in maybe an hour. And I did three hours with this wombat and I've got half the video filmed because she doesn't want to sit still. I can direct a snake where I want to go. I can't force a 25 kilo wombat to do anything. You want a toke just for the bite pressure? Tokes do look awesome. I'd like to, to catch a toke just to get a photo with it and do a video. We should do a video on feather tail gliders, greater gliders, yellow belly. I'd love to. There is a lot of Australian animals I'd like to do videos on. The hard thing is I've got to get access to them. I've tried doing videos in the past. Like, we've got wild platypus on my farm. I, I see them every day. And I'd love to do a video on them. But the problem is every time I've tried doing a video with me standing here and an animal 50 metres away, like, over there, nobody watches it. Um, so I need to find a facility or somewhere that's got one that I can be like, he is a greater glider. I don't know, that's just the videos people subscribe to us for, and that's fine. Like, that's that's a style that people obviously resonate with. Um, would love a wild platypus video. I'd love to do one. Unfortunately, I, I can't see it doing very well. So um, I'm basically trying to organise yeah, a facility that's got a platypus where I can hold and be like, this is the platypus. And Natasha. Who's this beautiful snake? This is Natasha. Told the teacher about the square poo and the teacher didn't believe her. If you want to, if, if Ada wants another fact that her teacher wouldn't believe her about, I don't think you can see it really on Natasha very well. The best example. You can tell your teachers that snakes have toenails. The tongue doesn't have a very good one. Um, I don't see it actually. Just keep her away from Natasha. Face that, man, Natasha. Natasha's eaten a few snakes in her lifetime, so I don't really want to risk it. All the way down here. You can see there's little claws. I don't know how to show you on a camera. He's got these little claws, wiggle, wiggle. They're toenails, they're left over, vestigial limbs from when millions of years ago snakes had legs. If you tell your teacher snakes have toenails, 99% of teachers don't believe you. Um, so it's a cool, a cool trivia fact. Not all snakes have toenails. In fact, it's only the pythons and the boas. Um, that being said, if you see a snake in the bush, don't look for toenails to check because you don't want to get that close. Just on the stream, beautiful olive. Thank you, Spellbound. Probably thinking of a frill neck lizard. Why can't you call them fingernails? I don't know. <laughs> in my head, it makes more snakes that snakes scent, the, the sense that snakes have toes. So you can call them fingernails, Carolyn. Are there dingoes on Fraser Island? There certainly is. Fraser Island's very famous for dingoes. Uh, funnily enough though, Fraser Island's famous for dingoes. People talk about how they're the only pure dingoes left in the world are on Fraser Island, and that is a myth. Um, I've worked with dingoes in zoos that have came from Charters Towers in Queensland, past purity tests, Simpson Desert, Tanami Desert, Alice Springs, Western Australia, all past purity tests. Um, there's pure dingoes in places all around Australia. Fraser Island might be the only place where there's 100% purity in all the dingoes. But even that, we're only saying that because it's an island. So people are like, well, because it's an island, dogs can't get there, they can't breed. But up until 20 years ago, there was feral horses on Fraser Island because there used to be a logging industry. So we're making the assumption that people brought horses to Fraser Island, but nobody ever brought a pet dog back before it was a national park. So they've never been purity tested. What do I feed her? She's fed on roosters. 
like six week old roosters every sort of six to eight weeks. Because they're on the rear or the back of the snake. Yeah, they're right down the end of her, basically at the base of her tail. We have over 8,000 islands. Maybe we should use them to help endangered species. Yeah, islands can be fantastic for helping endangered species. The issue with it is, we do have to be very cautious. Just this year, there's been some um, heated debates on uh, islands off Tasmania that were used as refuges for Tasmanian devils. When devil facial tumor disease broke out in Tasmania, some uh, well-meaning conservationists, they caught up some healthy devils, they released them on islands off the coast of Tasmania, and they bred up on those islands. So no, no facial tumor disease, maybe save the devils, but they've gone back. There was big penguin colonies. Today, there is not a single penguin on these islands because the devils have eaten them all. So yeah, islands can be fantastic. Um, you know, burrowing bedongs were saved on islands, lesser stick nest rats were rediscovered on islands, um, brush tail bedongs, the, the quokka. Everybody knows the quokka from Rottnest Island. They're actually found on mainland Western Australia but they're almost extinct. They're just surviving on Rottnest Island. So islands can be fantastic, but we have to be very cautious because islands have the most fragile ecosystems in the country. Uh, so we can't just go you know, releasing whatever we want on islands. We've got to be very, very cautious because islands, you know, the animals that already live there are just as important as the animals we want to protect. Do all snakes have toenails? Are they like ours and grow continuously? Not all snakes have toenails. It's a vestigial trait found in the more prehistoric snakes. So basically the pythons and the boas, which collectively we call weeds. Um, pythons and boas have them. None of the venomous snakes have them. Yeah, they're pretty much useless. It worked well for crockers on Rottnest Island. Yeah, so quokkas were never released onto Rottnest. Quokkas naturally occurred on Rottnest Island and on Western Australia. Um, and, and some people actually consider the, the mainland ones a different subspecies, which means we might still lose them and just have the Rottnest ones left. Um, but it means like we wouldn't want to go and release dingoes onto Rottnest to preserve dingoes because we might lose the quokkas. So, do dingoes have rotatable wrists? Dingoes have very flexible wrists. I'm not sure if I'd go as far as say rotatable, but they, they certainly are more flexible than a domestic dog. Could I beat a kangaroo in a fight? It depends if you're a VB drinker or a cider drinker. Um, I get this, like, it's a funny question. People say, you know, what could beat what in a fight? And um, a big part of it comes down to, do you have to win a fight or do you just have to make the other animal believe it can't win? So there is a lot, rum drinker, there is a lot of animals, rum drinkers think they can win every fight and half the time they're fighting a the wall. <laughs> but um, half the time, well, with, with most animals, the reality is you don't actually have to out-muscle the animal. You just have to make yourself seem more effort than it's worth. And, and you can see this when, when lions walk up to people on safaris and, you know, the experts, the guides, they put their hands near or bears and they yell at this bear or this lion and the lion, oh, I don't know, walk away. Because that lion could pull that bloke's arms out, beat him to death with it and stick it in his ears. But if the bloke makes it look like it's more hard work than it needs to be, the animal will back down. So, um, you know, it's, it's the same with, in a less joking way, it's the same with human self-defense, really. The goal doesn't have to be to win the fight. It has to make the fight unwinnable to the other person. If you make it more trouble than it's worth, um, you're going to survive. Glass lizards. Glass lizards is an American and European term for some of the legless lizards they get there. They get the name glass lizard because they can drop their tail. Um, so people feel like, yeah, the old times thought that they were breakable. You'd pick them up and their tails would fall off. So I got the name glass lizards. Do wedge-tailed eagles eat feral rabbits, wallabies, kangaroos? They certainly do. Um, there's been a lot of people sort of think that in some ways, rabbits are, are the most damaging invasive species we have, of, of mammals anyway. Um, but in some ways, rabbits have almost saved the wedge-tailed eagle. You see, wedge-tailed eagles would have lived on things like burrowing bedongs and wallabies and, um, you know, numbats and paddy melons and all the small mammals we had that have disappeared and their food dried up. Luckily for them, unluckily for everything else, rabbits have in many ways replaced those and they've still got rabbits to eat. 
Um, so yeah, red cells eat a lot of rabbit, uh, a lot of roadkill, stuff like that. Yeah, because they don't get to use gravy. Your nan got in a fight with the roo. I've had to catch a couple of kangaroos for wildlife carers and they take some wrestling. Did y'all hear about the guy? Yeah, I saw the video where he punched a kangaroo to save his dog. Yeah, I've seen that video. The, the dog, yeah, I don't blame the guy. The, the kang kangaroos can kill dogs, but that dog started it. it. It was a picking dog. You can tell it's a picking dog. He's got plates around his neck. Um, so it's a dog used to catch pigs. Well-trained picking dogs will chase nothing but pigs. Um, but that dog had clearly cornered that kangaroo. Um, the kangaroo was defending himself. But, you know, the, the guy wanted to get his dog out of the situation. Fair enough. Both blue bellies and alligator lizards can detach their tails. Yeah, it's called caudal autonomy, being able to drop your tail. Um, I don't know about your local lizards, but our lizards, when they do it, the tail keeps moving. So the predator will look at the tail. Wish I could do a video on numbats. I'd love to do a video on numbats. Unfortunately, I don't know any place in captivity that even keeps them. So I will one day. One day we can get do a trip around Australia or something and we can uh, do a video on numbats. But until then, we'll do the best we can. All right, guys. I think we're going to start wrapping things up. At Hall's Gap took three people to get her off. Oh, I think I missed the beginning of that. Oh, at, at, at Hall's Gap Zoo. Yeah, zoos in particular, when I worked at zoos, we had a policy. Any kangaroo that had to be bottle reared, if it was a male, was de-sexed. Because hand-raised male kangaroos can be particularly dangerous. The problem with hand-raised males, they get to an age where, you know, they want to start fighting. They want to punch on their teenage boys. And they go, all right, I'm, a, I'm territorial. I'm a human being. If they've been hand-raised, they think they're people. Oh, I'm going to fight people. Um, and we had male kangaroos that would go and kick over prams and all sorts of stuff. So we, um, we just made a flat-out policy. All male kangaroos, if they had to be bottle-raised, would have to be castrated. Sounds like a cider drinker. <laughs> See you tomorrow. Got to jump off night, guys. Thanks for coming along, leaving a thumbs up. That's right, guys. All right, I'm going to head off as well. We've been here for 67 minutes. But uh, I want to say thank you. It's been a you know, fantastic live stream. Tonight, sometimes I, I finish a live stream and I'm, I'm flat out. But you guys have been great tonight. We've had you know, a lot of conversation, good questions, new people. Um, and, yeah, thank you for the super chats. If you do want to help support the channel, guys, beyond super chats, I know a bunch of you are patrons already, but a few things you can do. The merch... We've got jumpers, we've got mugs, we've got t-shirts, we've got all sorts of stuff um, that you can find on our YouTube store in the shop tab. Um, so we've got merch. Uh, our patrons, you get discounts on the merch. Uh, hit me up if you haven't got your discount code. Uh, you can support us on Patreon and you'll see your name in the credits of some of our videos and all sorts of perks like that. Uh, but the biggest thing, guys, is like and share our videos and tell your friends to subscribe. The biggest thing you can do is get your friends to subscribe to our channel because as our channel grows, where it's, it's, it's not about getting a million followers just so we can say we're a million followers. It's about getting to a size where we can approach zoos and say, look, we got 20,000 people who are going to watch this. Will you let us, you know, can we steal half an hour of your time to film with the platypus? That, that's sort of the goal we need to get to to keep it coming. Do I have a schedule for streaming? Catch another one, yeah. Every week, uh, Tuesday night, 8.30 Eastern Australian time. So, same time every, every week. All right, guys. Thank you for sticking around. Uh, thank you again to Billy. You guys are, are awesome. I'm, I'm, I'm stoked and blessed to have you all. But um, I'll see you next week. Between now and then, be nice to wildlife. Have a good one. Take care.